everyone, thank you so much for bearing with us. Uh, thank you for joining us today in one of our first live presentations. Uh, I'm Jen Shanker from the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence, and I'm very excited to be here today with Dr. Lori DeSaltels. Um, Dr. DeSaltels has been an assistant professor at Butler University since 2016, where she teaches both undergraduate and graduate programs in the College of Education. Lori was also an assistant professor at Marion University in Indianapolis for eight years before she founded the Educational Neuroscience Symposium. Because of her work, Lori has been able to attract the foremost experts in the fields of educational neuroscience, trauma, and adversity, which significantly grow the conference each year. Lori's passion is engaging students through the application of neuroscience as it applies to attachment, regulation, and educator brain state and teaching students and staff about their neural anatomy, thus integrating mind-brain teaching, learning principles, and strategies into her coursework at Butler. She's created webinars for educators, clinicians, and administrators, illustrating how educators and students alike must understand the neural anatomy to regulate behavior and calm the brain. Lori is also the author of three books, including How May I Serve You, Reg Revelations in Education, Unwritten, The Story of a Living System, Eyes Are Never Quiet, and her new book, which I'm very excited about, uh, being released soon called Connections Over Compliance, Rewiring Our Perceptions of Discipline. Uh, you can find Lori's work and presentations, latest research on her website, www.revelationsineducation.com. Um, Dr. DeSaltels will be sharing today on why the developing brain and body needs safety, connection, and patterned repetitive experiences to create an organized and integrated brain structure, and to examine the neurobiology of adversity and resiliency, and explore and share practices and strategies that attend to the emotional, mental, and physiological well-being of all children. Welcome, Lori. You're muted. <laughs> thank you, Jen, and thank you for that kind introduction, and um, I'm really, really excited to share with everyone this afternoon. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to say a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, if anyone would like to ask a question, please just make sure that you're logged into your YouTube account, um, because that will allow you to ask a question in the chat. Um, we will monitor the chat throughout the talk, so even if you um, want to ask a question as you think of it and need to run or, you know, if you're staying for the whole session, which we hope you will, um, we will try to get to all questions at the end of the session. Um, so um, after this session, we will also be um, keeping this available on our YouTube site as well as putting reminders on our Facebook page. Um, so uh, please tune in and share with your friends if you um, love the content, which I know you will. Um, so I'm going to go off camera now while Lori presents, and then I'm going to come back during the Q and A. Thanks so much, Lori. All right. Thank you, Jen. And I'm going to share the screen here and we'll get started in presentation mode. So I want to thank everybody again for being a part of um, really just kind of a small presentation looking at really the divergence of all brain architecture as we um, ponder and look at the research of the developing brain and body, how adversity affects the developing brain and body, how trauma and accumulation of adversity and then how our brains and bodies are so complex and yet so intelligent in returning to resiliency, which is so exciting. I want to begin today with this quote, the child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. And I feel this is so significant as we look at the developing brain and bodies of all of our children and youth in this time. We are living right now in September of 2020 in the most chronic unpredictable time. COVID-19 has now been here for 
well, probably longer than six months, but um, many of you are starting school. Uh, many of you are parents where school is starting. Parents are teaching, teachers are parenting. We're hybrid, we're virtual, we're face-to-face, -face, we're wearing masks. It's such a complex time. And we've never had an experience in our nation like this. So we are all living with chronic unpredictability right now. As we think about this quote and we move in and looking at brain development, it is unique. It is just as unique as a fingerprint. So I'm gonna be very intentional today about not generalizing. Um, and, and I will say to you, I will be talking about the brain's development and the stress response systems in a very schematic way because we know that there is so much we do not know about the brain and how co the complexity of the brain and body and that bi-directionality and the communication of that. So I, I apologize for being schematic, but this is how um, it's best to understand it in this way. So I want to begin with something that looks really um, you know, warm and fuzzy, but it actually is the carrier of all brain development. It is development of the nervous system, and that is attachment, secure attachment. So when we start with this quote, whether you're working with 18-year-olds, um, eight-year-olds, eight-month-olds, um, it is so relevant. I'm afraid, said Rabbit. What are you afraid of, asked Bear. I don't know, replied Rabbit. I just am. Then I will sit with you until you're not afraid anymore, said Bear. We will face it together. So as we begin this um, time together, we now understand that our safe, available, emotionally available presence that's predictable and consistent is healing and repairing to children and adolescents who are carrying into school, into the community, significant amounts of anxiety, um, depression, and trauma and adversity. And that may um, arise from the classification or the ruling that they've been given. It may be an accumulation of traumas, um, but whatever the reason or reasons, we know that secure attachment, that one emotionally available caregiver can actually um, override the adverse childhood experiences um, in our children and youth's lives. So there are two conditions I want to begin with today that are for about us as adults as much as they are for our children and our adolescents. The brain is built from the very back to the front and from the inside out. And I speak about that because in the brainstem area is the seat or the area of safety. This is where we are literally scanning the environment our children, all of us, but the developing brain especially, is scanning the environment to make sure that they feel safe, that nothing feels too unfamiliar or too threatening. So safety is a neurobiological need for learning, for socializing, for well-being in general. The other condition that we must have is connection, which I just started with today. So connection, safety is in that brainstem, connection is through those experiences with a caregiver that is present and emotionally available. And so when we think about these two conditions, they literally integrate, and Jen said this so well at the beginning, they integrate and organize those, those early connections um, in brain architecture so that we are actually um, creating a pathway to this prefrontal cortex, which I'm gonna talk about in just a little bit. So think about safety and connection. Without those, we don't teach well, we don't learn well, we don't live life well, we don't lead well. Um, and they are critical for well-being. So when we think about the autism spectrum and we think about um, trauma and adversity, which I'm gonna be speaking about today, the accumulation of brain, the brain's development and beautiful aspect of resiliency. Um, I, I really loved um, looking at um, the fact sheet today from the National Institute 
um, because it is really sharing um, so many of the questions that we have right now. And I'm, you know, and I really think about not cerebral diversity, but cerebral divergence. Um, it's unique to each one of us. You know, when we think about children on the spectrum, adolescents and adults on the spectrum, it is, it is, there is such a unique propensity for creativity, for innovation, for socializing, for well-being in general. Um, and when we think about some of the challenges, we are looking at sensory disorganization in so many of our children and adolescents who come into our schools and come into our communities that are struggling with behaviors, that may be struggling with learning, um, that may be struggling with socialization. So my focus today is really going to be looking at connection and regulation because those build resiliency in brain architecture. And the brain is built to repair and to heal. It is not built to stay static. And so the beautiful thing about this framework that I'm going to talk about today is that through the framework, the brain is constantly perceiving experiences and the environment, and it's adapting to those. And so that is neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity is the miraculous superpower of the human brain. It's where every single experience that we encounter as children, doesn't matter our label, doesn't matter our classification, every single child, adolescent and adult, when we have an experience, that brain changes structurally and therefore functionally. So, and looking at COVID-19, this period of time and this virus has added layer upon layer upon layer of adversity to many families, to many communities, and to many children and adolescents who were struggling with connection and who were struggling with feeling and perceiving their environments as safe and as regulatory. So this is um, what we're gonna be addressing today. And I wanna begin with, um, I love this quote when we talk about the developing brain and body. If you lack a deep memory of feeling safe and loved, the receptors in the brain that respond to human kindness fail to develop. But if we feel safe and loved, our brain specializes in collaboration, play, and cooperation. We are constantly, if we are constantly feeling unloved and unsafe, then our brain specializes in managing only feelings of fear and abandonment. So it is literally the brain is an experience dependent organ that acts like a muscle and whatever we put in front of it, that brain has a workout. Just like when we go to the gym and we're working, you know, leg muscles, we're working back, core, whatever we are focusing on and being intentional about is exactly how our brains respond to the environments and experiences um, that are before them. So thinking about the adverse childhood experiences and how COVID has added some adversity and has really added some layered trauma onto this, there are three conditions that the brain really struggles to integrate. And it, it wears and tears on brain architecture. And COVID-19 has produced those three conditions. And I'm going to talk about these a little bit later, but I want to mention them right now. Chronic unpredictability is hard on the developing brain and body. When we don't know what's coming in an hour or what's coming this evening or what we are going to wake up to tomorrow morning, that is challenging for adult brains, but it is extremely um, extremely challenging for the developing brain and body. Isolation is the second condition that the brain cannot take. And many of us have experienced significant isolation over the last six months. And for our children and adolescents, for many of them, as they move into that second greatest time of brain development, which is that prepubescent or adolescent time, peers um, sometimes are, you know, that, that connection for many of our 
for many of our students. Sometimes teachers are, sometimes coaches, sometimes family members that we haven't been able to see or places that we absolutely love and they calm us and we haven't been able to go there or rituals that many of our children need to get calm, to feel connected, and they haven't been able to access those. So it's not just about people that help that makes us feel isolated. It's about environment. It might be about experiences and rituals that we have missed. Emotional and physical restraint is the third condition the brain really struggles with. And emotional restraint is not feeling as if you're able to say what you need to say or to be um, you know, authentic in ways that um, feel safe. And that physical restraint could be um, you're not able to go to the places um, that you need to. Um, you know, many, many children um, that have relied on specific events or jobs that they go to um, or, you know, people that they see there or the routines and procedures that feel so calming to them. Um, those have been, you know, those were those were taken away abruptly during COVID. And when I think about our children um, on the spectrum for, and again, I'm pulling from a personal experience, um, this has been really, really challenging. I have a very best friend, we've grown up together and her son, James, who is 28 years old, um, is has been working at um, the Notre Dame bookstore. And he's also been working in the cafeteria there. And that was suddenly, um, you know, that was that was that disappeared from his life. Um, and it was just such a difficult transition. And it wasn't so much the job as it was the connections, the environment and the patterned repetitive rituals that he needed to regulate his nervous system. So when we think about any of us. Um, whether we are um, going through significant anxiety, whether we are struggling with attention, whether um, we are struggling with sensory issues or emotional um, depression or feeling um, just feeling what we say sometimes is just rough feeling out of sorts. And when it's chronic, it affects not only the developing brain, but the developing nervous system. So I want to talk a little bit about trauma and adversity and how um, it affects each of us. Now, and this is um, really significantly new science. We typically think of adversity and trauma as being psychological, but I wanna be very clear this afternoon. What we now understand is that when we are experiencing adversity, whether it's emotional, mental, or um, you know, physical, it is body overwhelm. It's when information from the external environment or the internal environment when it comes in and it's too much, too fast, and too soon. And that information oftentimes lands in the body. The language of the body is survival. And the language of the brain stem is survival. And both the brain, the brain and the body are constantly communicating. So implicit memories are memories that are below the waterline of consciousness and they're body memories. They're held in the body. And what we are learning today is that there are millions, millions of bits, 11 million bits of fragmented sensory information that is coming in from the environment every second of every day. And that is increasing with time. This is overwhelming to human beings in general. And those 11 million bits of sensory information that are subconscious, they are not conscious, implicit body memory it, that's coming in, we can't process, we can't integrate it, but it lands in the body. So our when we talk about trauma and adversity, oftentimes we're not able to process this information as it's coming in and it's overwhelming to the nervous system, which is a physiological challenge. You can understand something cognitively, but that's very different than how you feel about something. So many, um, I think of our oldest son, Andrew, um, he has struggled with generalized anxiety 
and, and, and it's kind of gone from, you know, very um, sometimes acute to um, then more generalized, but he literally, we can, he can process cognitively that he's doing well. He's, um, you know, he's, we, as we say at our house, he's walking the walk, he's staying on course, he's back in school, you know, he's got these goals, he's accomplished this, but how does he feel about himself? And that is something that Andrew struggles with even as a young man today. What you know and how you feel are very different. And we are feeling and sensing creatures who think. We are not thinking creatures who feel. We feel and sense the environment inside of us and outside of us. And when that environment feels safe and when we feel felt, then we begin to shift and to really evaluate and assess our own sense of self. So the body remembers what the mind forgets. And I love this quote. I shared this. Jen has heard me share this before. If you want to know the way the wind is blowing, look at the sand. If you want to know how a child is feeling, look at their body. And I cannot tell you how true that is. And right now in the work that I'm doing here in Indianapolis, I not only teach at the university, but I'm back in the classroom. And I forgot to share that at the beginning. Um, I've been back in the classroom two days a week for the past seven years. I would have nothing to say to you today if I were not back in the classroom. I'm in a brand new school district. I'm with third and fourth grade this semester, and I am literally watching their bodies as they come in. Um, I'm just checking in, and I'm and I'm reading them nonverbally. And this is this is what we this is how we can begin to connect with our children as parents and as as um, educators and therapists and clinicians. So brains are grown by how we feel and think. And when there is signif significant trauma, we go from a stress response system that is adaptive to one that is very health damaging. Secure attachment is intimately tied to stress regulation, which is tied to all behavioral challenges. And the newest research out of Harvard right now is sharing that one million new synapses are occurring every second in the first year of life. So that greatest time of brain development is in that first 1,000 days of life. That's when the brain is the stickiest. And even though you might be working with an eight-year-old, a 10-year-old, an 18-year-old, that is when those experiences stick and they begin to form those implicit memories, because that's the only memory type that we have from out of the womb for the first two years of life. That explicit, um, that explicit conscious memory does not come on board until four or five years of age. So those memories that we're holding are not only sticky and they and they stick to the body and to the brain, but they also are not, they are subconscious, non-conscious. So um, trauma leaves scars on our emotions, which are stored as chemicals in the cells. And it's kind of like running on injured knees before they're healed. So I want to, um, and again, feel free to take a picture of these slides if you would like, but just a couple more bullets I wanna go over with you today. Brains predict experiences based on those experiences. That's true for all of us. We are constantly subconsciously comparing our experiences and evaluating if the new ones are going to feel safe or are they going to feel threatening to us because patterns of behavior are deeply woven into cellular structure and memory, neural tissue, and development all change with patterned repetitive experiences. Trauma is an embedded experience touching all neural pathways. And I wanna say this, even if you have to get off here in, in five minutes, I want you to think and leave with this today. We ache to be heard and held in the reality of our experiences without judgment or any impulse toward anybody fixing it for us. And this is the research of Bonnie Badenock. And I think it is so true for all of our children. We may not want to be touched physically, but we want a presence. 
We may not want eye contact, like firm eye contact, but we want to be seen and we want to be heard and we want to be felt. It doesn't matter your label. It doesn't matter your classification. And that is something that is part of the regulatory practices that we'll be talking about today. So as a teacher, as a parent, as a clinician, um, as anyone who sits beside our children who are struggling with regulation and struggling with connection, who are coming in with a variety of classifications and rulings and labels, I want to ask this, what if silence just arose when it wanted and left after it had done its work? We're not really using or implementing interventions, but what if we used silence to be a part of that embodied experience that, en that envelops our presence? Because then we follow the child. We follow the child. And that is the most another most significant piece of developing these secure attachments. We let go of our agenda and we li literally watch the body and the nonverbal communication of the child. A felt sense of safety is the bedrock of healing trauma. This is from Dr. Stephen Porges. Nervous systems influence our body's moment to moment expression. And I want to go to the second quote on the right hand side, understanding we wear our hearts on our faces and in our voices. Again, Dr. Stephen Porges. So last bullet on the right side, healing trauma is holding a safe, warm, stable, responsive space. And we need embodied experiences to counteract that trauma. And that is why restorative and reparative relational discipline is critical. So what we're talking about today is the brain's developing architecture and how that intimately affects how we perceive the world, how we feel our way through the world, how we relate in our worlds, and how we begin to learn. And so it begins from the back, the brain stem, which is survival. The brain, we have a brain for three reasons, and they're right here. The very first purpose of a brain in order of priority is safety. We need to feel safe, to feel connected, and to learn. So the language of the brain stem is safety, and we can begin to identify if we feel safe through sensations. And I want you to think about that today. Sensations are sometimes comforting to our children, and then there are troubling sensations. But sensations are the language. That is how we know if a child is feeling safe or not, and if they are ready to connect or not. So are those sensations troubling sensations, or are those sensations repairing sensations? And then we have the, the, the limbic system, the emotional um, am I feeling felt? And when these lower areas are, I'm going to use my mouse here, when these lower areas are integrated and they are organized with um, pre the presence of those that create safety, also the environments that create safety and the experiences that create safety, then we can literally, we see this pathway being created to this prefrontal cortex which is where our executive functions are held. And this is our, this is where we do life and this is where we do school. This is the seat of sustained attention, emotional regulation, problem solving, discerning. Um, and, and this is where we are able to access creativity and, and we can also be flexible. We can transition well when we can begin to access those. But this, this cortex, the prefrontal cortex, sometimes it's not finished developing until late 20s or early 30s. So as I've mentioned, as we move through, and, and I'm going to be skipping some of these slides because I don't, my time always goes too fast and I have enough for you for two full days. Um, our early history, what we've experienced in those early days and those first couple of years are held in embodied implicit memory. And 
I want to share with you today that what we are learning is that adversity and trauma are, are generational. So we are not just talking about individual trauma today. We're talking about generational trauma. We're talking about historical trauma, racial trauma, institutional trauma, looking at systemic trauma and how all of our bodies have carried the histories of our ancestors' experiences and hurt people hurt people. And so what's so beautiful about beginning to look into this framework is that we are delving into not just looking at adverse childhood experiences, but pairs of ACEs. How have the community ACEs impacted families? How has racial oppression impacted the developing brain and bodies of our black and brown children and youth? And so this is um, an exciting time. It's also a time that we must move forward now. And, um, and it takes a lot more than restorative practice circles because this is, it, this, is this body trauma. Um, that, that we have been talking about. So in pain and fear, our young embodied brains sweep these early experiences into the ongoing flow of the developing brain. And it gets tucked away in the right limbic system. It gets tucked away in the brain system, in our bellies, um, and in our nervous system. So this is something that, you know, we are learning about, and this is new research. We know that those implicit memories are from birth through the age of 18 months to two years. Again, not definitive, but we know that our memories are generally below conscious awareness until four or five. And as we move through this today, I wanna to start off with a practice and a strategy right away so I can share with you that we are using the language of the body and the language of the brain stem to help our children to feel calm and connected. And that's tapping into their um, sensations. So for some of our older kids, we have them draw, a, we have them pick a sensation word and they can give it a color, a line, a shape. Um, they can, um, anytime we draw and use art um, in a way that feels that they love, or if they just want to journal it, or if they just, however they want to show edgy, or however you want to show teary, or warm, or itchy, or jittery or um, tense, or tight, or numb. You can see the difference. Sensations are physicalized feelings. And I put this over here, language of the body and language of the brainstem is sensory. And that's why so many of our children and adolescents and us, we can get overwhelmed and triggered by a smell, a sound, something that feels off in our bodies, your heart starts to beat fast, you get sweaty, you get blotchy, you start shivering. Something, that, a piece of clothing that you, that, that you see can trigger you, someone's voice. So this is what I'm actually, the, I've been back in school with third and fourth graders for four weeks now. In Indiana, we've been back. And so with our masks on, social distancing, um, and I have some pictures to show you, we're talking about, we're making the association between sensation and um, feelings. So these, we showed these to our students yesterday and they get it. They love these, this makes sense, a pair of rubber boots stuck in the mud. Stuck is a sensation. Sometimes you get butterfly feelings in your belly. Sometimes your belly is gurgling. Gurgling is a sensation or rumbling. Sometimes we feel warm or sometimes we're just feeling icy, uh, numb, watery. I mean, the kids pick out, they, they can tell you what sensations they're feeling. I wanna share this with you. This came to me from a teacher this week and this is why when you draw it, it is calming to the nervous system because you take out that, you kind of loosen up or jiggle out that right hemispheric sometimes or that body memory. And when you get it out of the brain and body and you put it in a safe container that's out here, which happens through art sometimes, um, it's calming to the nervous system. And the right hemisphere has more of a connection to the um, body self 
than the left hemisphere because that right hemisphere is connected to the core sense of self. So this little, this student, um, and, and this was not one of my students, this was another student the teacher shared with me, drew his brain on a treadmill. And that's how he's been feeling um, like over the past several months. And he was able to say it feels scary and he feels um, unsafe. He showed his mouth open and he feels nervous and the way he gets calm. And this is what he shared. He puts a weighted blanket over himself and he sleeps to calm his heart rate because this teacher um, has been going through our trainings. And so we are teaching the kids the language of how, they, how they're feeling. It, the kids love this. They want to know about the amygdala. They want to talk about the hippocampus. They love, we, I had um, Gabriel, I will never forget Gabe. He was a fifth grade student of mine two years ago at the Butler University Lab School. And, and, um, and so Gabe was, um, he was on the um, autism spectrum and he loved during the neuroscience fair to talk about the locus ceruleus. And he, I learned from Gabe what the locus ceruleus was about. I, I can't believe what he was able, it's in the brainstem and it, it's part of our stress response system. So um, boy, I, I'm so sorry for my spelling mistakes. I've got, I did this really quickly and I see it in the spell brains there. So I've got to work on that. So anyway, um, I love this looking at generational trauma. Dr. Noel Larson says, if something is hysterical um, to a child or to an adult, it is probably historical. So fetuses in the womb can learn, perceive, and feel, and remember um, their, the outside world. They're experiencing it through um, the mother's brain and body state. We know that adrenaline and cortisol cross the placenta. And so we are, when we are born, our heart rate aligns with our mother's. So we either begin in a growth, kind of a calm, regulated state, or we can be born into that survival protection state. And that is the chemical architecture of our beginning. So um, I'm gonna skip a couple of these. I, and again, the survival brain is fight flight um, and also shut down. I'm gonna show you a chart in just a minute, but please understand that these three conditions I've already talked about that COVID has produced um, and that so many adverse childhood experiences have produced. Um, looking at um, racial oppression and racism in our country right now is producing chronic unpredictability and isolation and the feeling of emotional and physical restraint. So since the original adverse childhood experience study, the new adversities of 2020, um, there are so many more adversities that contribute to the trauma and, and to the impact on the child's developing brain and body. So as I mentioned, we're looking at historical trauma. We're looking at intergenerational trauma, institutional trauma, um, racial, multiracial, all of this. But the good news is that human beings have the capacity to learn, change, and grow. We are genetically designed to mend building these protective factors, which are connections, relationships. These are protective factors and emotional buffers that prevent further wounding. I love the research of Ann Mastin, um, who talks about the resilience in children, and, um, and it happens in bite-sized chunks, and it, it happens, it's ongoing, and it happens in what Dr. Bruce Perry calls dosing, and it can happen in two seconds, in 10 seconds, in two minutes. Relationships are literally ongoing touch points. And, and that's what we'll be talking about. So let me share some practices for you at home, in your practice, and at school. One of the best ways that we can sit beside our children with regulation and connection right now is creating um, graffiti walls or whatever you want to call these places um, rituals where kids can share their lived, felt, perceived experiences. 
whether they draw those, whether they journal those, whether they doodle those or scribble those or record themselves or sing about them, um, use rhythm, use poetry, it does not matter. This is one I know that we would have had this in our house. As a mom, I would have had this for Andrew, Sarah, and Reagan. I think sharing our lived experiences is one of the most powerful ways we can not only increase touch points, but we can also share, and it's a regulatory practice. What you can name, you contain, and what is shareable is bearable. So um, <clears throat> please take a picture of some of these questions. These are questions for the graffiti wall or <clears throat> for embodied experiences. As a teacher, we've been sharing these in our morning meeting and our afternoon rituals. This, it, there, there will never be a more important time than to create rituals at home, in our um, counseling sessions, in our uh, practices that help our kids feel safe and connected through tapping into their sensations and emotions. And one of the best ways to do that is have these type of questions where kids can give these questions colors and shapes and lines. They can act them out. They can journal them. Um, they can draw them. But these are some of the questions that, that are driving the graffiti walls that, and I would add to these two, and I, I haven't done that yet because I've been back in the classroom. How has it felt to be back in school? How does it feel to be learning virtually? How does it feel to see your teacher through Zoom? How does it feel? Um, and for many of our kids, and I don't want to leave this out, being at home has been, has felt safe to them and they felt connected at home. So Many of our children come to school for family privilege, which means they come for safety and connection. But for some of our kids, being at home has been um, kind of a relief. It has been, they've been able to do school um, in a much calmer way. So I don't, I don't wanna say that this has been negative or positive for everybody. As I mentioned, there is a new national peer reviewed study that is showing how our racial discipline gap and our racial achievement gap um, for our um, black and white students in the United States predicts a jump or narrows. And we know this, this is something that this is no, this isn't new research, but what's new about it is it's national and it's peer reviewed. And um, so there's a great three or four minute video out of Stanford um, that shares this research too. So um, when we look at trauma and we look how it hits us, we've got to look at um, Dr. Kenneth Hardy's work from Drexel. And again, I'm gonna go quickly here, but racial oppression um, is an adverse childhood experience because starting at around fourth or fifth grade through middle school and through high school, our children and adolescents are going through the most vulnerable, fragile time, the second greatest time of brain development, and they are beginning to create an identity. Um, and so this, um, for us as a community, and, and looking at, um, you know, how our presence, how our, our white privilege can implicitly impact um, our children of culture is something that, um, you know, we, the door has been open and we need to take um, a, a very, very hard look at this. So all behaviors are communicating signals and those signals are giving us an opportunity to look underneath the behavior and ask why the pain? What type of world is this child what did they inherit or what type of world, um, what happened, what's happening in this child's world or what's not happening in this child's world. So every parent is doing their best. I did my best, you all are doing your best. I believe all of us are doing our best in every moment, but we are in a time where our children are picking up on the emotional contagion of events and experiences that are happening around them and inside of them. And again, we are feeling creatures who think, we are not thinking creatures who feel. 
This quote from L. Tobin is very important to share with you this afternoon. He's violent, you say, perhaps, but imagine what it takes for a child to strike an adult, his only source of survival. Imagine the depth of terror behind this bravado. Imagine the depth of hurt. So we have right now a viral fear, just as we have a viral pandemic. And many of, I see it, many of our teachers and social workers and counselors are returning to work with masks. And, and there's a lot of fear because we are living in a chronically unknown time. And the trauma that has layered from COVID um, is producing this layered fear. And what happens is when we have those adversities and traumas already present in our bodies, they become like scar tissue. And so they don't have really the, the nerves, they don't have the capacity to grow. So they become you know, somewhat stuck and, um, and we feel sometimes hopeless and we feel sometimes helpless. But what the good news is telling us is that when you understand how adversity and trauma affect your children, your students and yourself, then we begin to repair through connection and um, repairing regulatory practices. So this is from, I, I, I love, this kind of shows the generational trauma. Children are very open and feel the pain and suffering in their environments. If the mother is suffering, the baby is suffering too. And all is connected to physiological illnesses, um, addiction. We're talking about how ad adverse childhood experiences are highly correlated um, you know, to our mental, emotional, and physiological health. So as we look at trauma and we look at the developing brain and body and we look at adversity, we have to understand um, the impact of that generational. So what we're talking about and what I've been talking about this afternoon is a framework. It's not a program. It's a framework that has four pillars and it has the very first pillar is my brain and body state. And that's what I'm going to emphasize as we kind of wind down today. A calm, regulated adult can calm an anxious, dysregulated child. But a dysregulated adult cannot calm a dysregulated, anxious child. This framework is about me personally as a mom and it's about me professionally, but it begins with me being intentional and paying attention to my body and brain. The second pillar of this work is co-regulation. And that is simply saying, when I am feeling calm and grounded and balanced and emotionally available, I can share that with my children. I can share that with the people around me. That is healing and repairing in itself. That's what we call an embodied experience. The third pillar of this work is touch points. Touch points are those moments, which I've mentioned of connection. A touch point could be noticing a haircut, noticing a new pair of tennis shoes, noticing a smile. It could be validating. I, I can't believe how hard this must feel to you. I'm so sorry that you're struggling with this. What do you need from me? It's it's gentle questioning, but it's validation and it's noticing, and it happens most often in nonverbal communication. It happens through our facial expression. It happens through our tone of voice, and it happens through our posture and how we gesture. And the fourth pillar of this work is, I mentioned this too, we are teaching our kids about their neuroanatomy. We are teaching them the, the language. Because when you understand that, that how your brain is firing means, you know what? I'm not a bad person. I am doing the best I can. And this is how my brain is firing and wiring right now. And our children who've been labeled behavior disordered, emotionally disturbed, attention deficit, hyperactivity disordered, um, Asperger's, I mean, we, we just label, label, label. And what I want to say is this divergent brain architecture is, would we understand the science of it? 
that is calming and it's empowering to our children and our adolescents. And this is what we teach them. And it happens through our procedures and our routines and our transitions. So we're not asking clinicians or parents or teachers to do anything extra. We're asking them to be intentional about how you begin a morning, how you end an evening, how you end the day, how do you create transitions that are predictable? How do you create routines that feel safe? How do you tap into sensory regulatory practices in a really natural way? Because what we understand is this area, the right hemisphere, that, that amygdala in the limbic system, just like an injured knee, um, in, in any inflammation that we have in our body, the brain is not immune to inflammation. And when we have an overproduction of cortisol and adrenaline, then we can see an overactive amygdala, which is your fight flight response, which is a survival response. And that's when we see kids constantly overreacting, constantly reflexive in their actions and in their behaviors. And so we also need to pay attention to this area of the brain. This is the hippocampus. And so the hippocampus looks like a little seahorse and it sits next to the amygdala and they work together encoding emotional memory. And when there is chronic cortisol production, we can see damaged tissue in the hippocampus because the receptors, those glucocorticoid receptors can't take that ongoing cortisol and those receptors begin to die off. If a child can't remember, then they can't learn well. And this is something that you know we're teaching teachers and we're working with administrators across the country and, and something we need to think about. One of the things that I wanna share with you today, and this is critical, this is a practice, a strategy you can put into place right after this um, uh, webinar today. We have these tiny little ear muscles, less than a millimeter, and it's called the stapedius muscle. And when a child or us, when we are in fight, flight, or shutdown, when we are in survival brain, and you know this with kids, they'll cover their ears, they'll scream, they'll yell, they'll run out of a room. Um, you might see some repetitive um, behaviors. When they can't take it, what's happening is that that little muscle has expanded and it is paying attention to everything in the environment. And you, it's like you, Dr. Stephen Porges says, it's almost like you hear predator-like sounds. So you cannot pay attention or focus on a conversation or a directive. When that muscle expands, it is for the brain's protection. It's an adaptation. And so we need to understand how important co-regulation is because for us to attempt to give a child a consequence or to talk to a child and expect them to be attentive when they are in survival state is never going to, to, never going to work. We also know that our bellies carry our emotional health and that there is a direct pathway between our belly brains and our heart brains and our limbic system. And um, our relationship, so food is connected. And I don't mean just food. I'm talking about the associations that we created as infants and as young children before conscious memory was on board, how did we begin to implicitly look at mealtime? Or were we fed and given liquid nourishment consistently? What was that mealtime like? Was there conversation? Did it feel safe? Did it feel um, connected? And so many of our children come into school and um, we know that 90 to 95% of serotonin is made in the bellies and serotonin is, is the brain and body's master regulator. You know, it's responsible for so many um, body and brain functions, but a lot of it is about um, calmness. And 50% of dopamine is created in the belly and, you know, which is our motivational, um, you know, reward neurohormone in the body. 
So what we're doing in schools is we're taking lunchtime and really making that a touch point. So when kids, when we have a bottle of water, you know, we share that bottle of water. We don't, we don't give the water to the student and say, this is good for you. We say, we share it. We create an experience where we're having a snack, a bottle of water or a meal together. And that is a touch point for a child. So um, I'm going to skip some slides now because I want to go to, and I, we have to leave time for questions too. This is one of the most important things I can leave you today or leave with you today. Um, so what we are learning from the framework of applied educational neuroscience, this, our children are not disordered. The divergent um, cerebral functioning and structures of the brain is a reordering of neural networks. We've been labeling and saying disorder long enough, and we've been talking about behaviors long enough. It's time we start to talk about the reordering of neural networks, and let's start talking about brain and body states and not behavior. Because when we do that, when, when we talk about brain architecture, we are empowering our children, we are empowering their families, we're empowering our instructional and our therapeutic practices, and we really are being more accurate when we talk about brain circuits and um, brain and body states. So again, relational contagion is where we begin, and a regulated calm adult can regulate a dysregulated anxious child. And so when you think about Abraham Maslow's hierarchy, we know that probably was never a hierarchy, but our physiological needs, our brainstem needs, our love and belonging needs, our limbic system needs, and then our cortex, um, when we are able to be creative and innovative and create a pause and pay attention, that is cortical. And, and when, when we talk about self-esteem, this is about the adult brain and body state. So if you work in a clinic, if you, if you are an administrator on the Zoom meeting today, we are giving this to staff and we are saying, it is so significant for you to check in with each other, hold each other accountable, have partners, because a calm, regulated school has calm, regulated students. And the same is true for clinics and the same is true for true for our practices. So we look at um, what our triggers are. And it's good as a group, you know, as a grade level, as a department, to really look at your triggers and what do you do when your buttons are pushed? And because this is mirrored in the values that you hold. And what is something you could change? So this is just a simple exercise that you could use. We also, with the adults, we also look at what is your own personal language of adversity? What do you do internally and externally? And how do you recover and repair? And then once we understand how we use regulatory practices, some of us need to take a walk to feel better. Some of us take a hot shower. Some of us wrap up with a weighted blanket. Some of us eat wheat thins. Some of us listen to music or we need to talk to somebody. Some of us need space and time. We need, we need to get away from everybody. We need a patterned, repetitive experience to calm us and our children are no different. So this is something that I wanna share with you today that we can share with our students. And oftentimes we can calm the nervous system through practices that put a break on the 10th cranial nerve called the vagus nerve. And this is Dr. Stephen Porges's research so let me share with you, and Dr. Ariel Schwartz has shared this, this 10th cranial nerve connects our viscera to our brainstem. And so our bellies, our hearts, and our brains are connected with this 10th cranial nerve. And we, when that nerve has a break on it, when we have slowed it down, it's like taking your car and slowing down to pull into your driveway. When you put a brake on that and pull in and you're not hitting the accelerator, then you're going to have a nice experience. But if you hit the accelerator as you pull into the driveway, that could be a catastrophic experience. So 
it's called a cold blast, splashing your water with cold, um, or splashing your face with cold water, 30 seconds at the end of your shower with cold water, maybe for our children, sometimes an ice pack feel good on their neck or on their forehead, um, taking a walk, taking three deep breaths, skipping around the block. Many of our children need to move to regulate. Um, they need something heavy to carry for, a, you know, they, um, there's a high correlation with omega-3 fatty acids in calming the nervous system, activating the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, again, a probiotic humming is extremely um, beneficial to putting a break on the vagus nerve, just as you're doing humming to yourself gargling even with water a few times a day chanting for a few minutes um, is calming giving yourself a foot massage rubbing the right side of your throat can activate that parasympathetic response so some of these i want to make sure that we are attending to those who are caring for our children and our youth um, and many of these practices will have carry over or they will carry on for them carry over to, the, to them too so um, this is the polyvagal graph, and we share this with our adolescents, um, and so that they get a really clear picture that when you feel calm and you're functioning from your cortex, you're functioning down here in the social engagement system. When you start to get irritated or anxious or worried, you start to move into fight or flight, and this is where our heart rate goes up, our respiration goes up, and our blood pressure goes up, and then we can't think clearly. Um, our emotions are always overriding the way that we um, can process um, each other and how we respond. And then this is a different pathway here. The fight, fight, flight of the autonomic nervous system is one pathway, but the frozen shutdown pathway is called what we call a dorsal vagal pathway. And that's where our heart rate and our respiration and our blood pressure lowers, but to a dangerously low level. And we, our body secretes endorphins that help numb and raise the pain threshold. This is where I get very worried about children and adolescents because we see kids shut down here. We see high absenteeism in school. We see very little work turned in. We might see children dissociating um, just I it's kind of staring off completely disengaged. There's hopelessness. There's cutting that happens here. Suicidal ideation, very withdrawn. That's a very different pathway. But when we share this with students and with staff, um, it's important that students can track sometimes where they are. And for younger children, we have a, a, an elementary, a younger version. So that children can know that if I'm feeling calm and, you know, and if I'm feeling peaceful, and if I'm able to do what I need to do, I'm functioning from my cortex or in the amygdala, midbrain, fight, flight, or I've downshifted to the brainstem. And what I want to share today is that most of us don't realize the significance of this chart from Dr. Bruce Perry from the childtrauma.org. Um, we, when we are functioning from our neocortex, our prefrontal cortex, we can think abstractly and but then as we begin to get worried or anxious and we downregulate, we begin to think in concrete ways. We can't think clearly as much. We become, in a, we become in a mental, emotional state of alertness. And then when we get to the amygdala, the full on fight flight, we are in alarm, fight flight or shut down. And then we literally do not care about words, consequences, logic, stickers or rewards and most of us as parents and teachers we discipline here and this is where this is the this is where we absolutely get no change we can unintentionally unintentionally escalate our kids if we are trying to solve discipline issues here or we can unintentionally re-traumatize them this is the area of the brain where we want to share our calm and we want to regulate ourselves first and calm ourselves because as we down regulate, then we move to the brainstem, which is more reactive and more reflexive. So what, when we think of co-regulation, we want to upregulate positive emotion and down regulate negative emotion. 
So as just as we've talked about today, that brain develops from the brain stem to the cortex, and that language of the brain stem is sensation. The language of the limbic system then is emotions and feelings, and the language of the cortex is words. So as we think about this framework of touch points and my brain and body state and co-regulation and teaching our children about their neuroanatomy, this all weaves and is, it's all contextualized into a new lens of discipline. Schools and districts and homes that are trauma responsive are not trauma responsive because of the programs they've implemented. They are trauma responsive because they have changed their discipline protocols. They are focusing on co-regulation and connection Discipline is preventative. It happens in your routines and in your procedures. It's not reactive. And it's a tier one practice. If you think of RTI, it's a tier one practice for all students. It's not about these kids or those kids. It's for all students. Discipline and behavior management are never about the student. They are always about me. They are always about the adult. And so I want us to think about these four universal growth needs that come from the circle of courage that are created by Larry Brintro and um, Nick Long. I think Larry Brintro, no, Brokenhurst. Um, Larry Brintro and Dr. Brokenhurst. Belonging. If I have a classroom, a school in my own home, in my practice, I am going to have these posted. And I wanna think about my children's developing brain and body. I wanna think about my youth's developing brain and body. And I wanna ask, am I important to somebody here? Is that child feeling important? If not, how can we use connection? Am I good at something here? Are we tapping into that child's passions and their interests and their expertise? Can I influence my world here? What type of rituals and experiences can we create in that environment that helps that child or that adolescent feel purposeful? And the last one, how can I share my gifts to help others here? So how can I not only share what I'm good at, but see it? This, you, we wanna model the behaviors that we want to see from our, our um, children. So that's why co-regulation is so important. Each child comes into this world with the, with, the, with the capacity to sense their world, perceive their world, and feel their world. And we do that as infants. This little guy is my great niece, my, my great nephew, Brooks, and he's looking at Avery when she's hysterical. And at eight weeks old, he reaches over and grabs her hand. And he knew how to do that because he was exposed to those experiences that were calming, that were, that were regulatory, um, and that um, he was able to take that co-regulation and was able to share that even at eight weeks old. So the human brain and body are built for resiliency. They are built to repair and they are built to be social. Our brains are historical organs, they're experience dependent, and they are social. We cannot live without each other. And even at eight weeks old, we know how to connect with each other. We may not be able to verbalize it. We may not be able to give it a story or a narrative. We may not be able to look at each other, but we know how to use our bodies to calm each other. And this is relational regulation. It's emotional contagion through face, and, and tone and looking at <clears throat> um, posture and gestures. This is actually a friend of mine who was a police security resource officer in the Indianapolis Public Schools. And Precious was called down to a first grade room um, for a little boy who, has, who get, was given the classification and label of attention deficit disordered. Um, also, he was labeled as autistic and um, he would have huge disruptions in his first grade classroom 
um, daily. Um, he would come in and he would get triggered and um, he would scream and he would yell and he would destroy uh, much of the classroom. And Precious, my friend, the security resource officer was called down, down often. And one, after, one afternoon, um, she was able to use her body to get him just into the hall. And she finally just, when he threw himself down to cry, she laid down with him and she just waited. She didn't speak. Um, she didn't even look at him. She just waited. And this is, I think, the perfect example of what co-regulation looks like. It is sharing our calm. It is showing our, um, our uh, stability, our planted sense of self. Um, and each moment with a child allows that child to, child to metabolize and digest some of that troubling sensation that has overwhelmed that body and brain. That's why each moment can be a therapeutic moment. So let me check the time. And um, I, let me just, I'm gonna end here. And again, I apologize that I am um, not getting through all of these slides, but I do wanna end with um, just a couple of last slides for you and show you what you're going to be getting today. So, um, and we can share these. So Jen, you just let me know how we can share some of these, but these are focused attention practices where we are sharing in an experience with our students. They're taking two or three deep breaths. They're focusing on a sensation like a taste or they're focusing on a sound or we're using movement. Um, we're mirroring and mimicking each other. Um, and it's, it's really about movement and breath and rhythm. And, um, if the child feels comfortable with some pressure or touch or not, but we're using a focused attention practice as a regulatory practice and, and brain intervals to get that brain engaged and to wake that brain up. So we have some brain interval cards that we share with teachers and administrators, the brain intervals wake up the brain stem, and then the focused attention practices help us um, to really understand how important it is for our brain and body state to feel calm and so that we are able to learn. And I wanted to show you these, <clears throat> these are from this week. Oh, I'm gonna get a sip. Our students made these brains <coughs> and they um, are tapping into which part of the brain feels calm. So are they coming from their cortex? Are they working in the amygdala or are they in the brain stem? <coughs> and let me go to a few more. This is a brain tracking sheet that we're using. We're not talking about behaviors. And I wanted to show you an example of one. So the kids actually, when they arrive in the morning for morning meeting, they do some little bit of reading. You can see DMR, math. They can check if they are in the green, the cortex, red, amygdala, or they've downshifted into the brainstem. And so we have this on a Word document. Um, and again, this is very important to talk to the kids about brain and body state and not talking about um, behaviors. And that is all I have time for today because I want to answer questions. This is, um, I will send this, this is in my new book. This shows sensory practices, connection practices, and cortical practices. It's its, its own ebook of 30 strategies that are all about regulation and touch points and then putting a story, sharing a narrative when we do feel calm. So you can see there's the name of the practice and then here are the descriptions of some of the strategies. Some of our families are, and we're creating amygdala reset stations in our homes during COVID and also at school. So this is a place where we share our calm, but we don't use it just to regulate. We also use it to celebrate so it doesn't become punitive. Um, it doesn't even have to be a specific area. It could just be a bucket. So we ask the students, what feels calming to you? What feels regulating to you? 
So we are calling it by their scientific name. It is the amygdala first aid station. And you can see some pictures of some of the ones that students have created and classrooms have created. Um, and this, this we did a neuroscience fair. Um, and this is where Gabriel that I mentioned earlier talked about the locus ceruleus. And, um, and so you can kind of see some areas. We have regulation cards um, with patterned repetitive experiences for our younger children. And so that they can learn fun facts about animals and they can use their body and breath for regulation. And then we track those. So I'm gonna give you my contact information at the end. And again, I apologize. I always have too much, and ne never too much, but I need more time always with everyone. So um, I just wanna thank you today. Um, Michael McKnight and I wrote Unwritten Together, which is a lot about what we've talked about today. And Eyes Are Never Quiet um, is the book that many districts are using that Michael and I wrote. And then this is our new book, Connections, uh, my new book, Connections Over Compliance, Rewiring Our Perceptions of Discipline. And this is my contact information. So please feel free to reach out to my, uh, to my website, Revelations in Education. My Butler University email is right there. Please feel free to follow me on Twitter, on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. And um, I just, Jen, thank you so much for inviting me today. Again, I apologize for flipping through so many slides, but you know what? We just, I wanted to make sure that I hit the ones that I could in an hour and 20 minutes. And do I'm hoping we have enough time for questions if there are any. Yes, we definitely do. Um, do you want to, yes, I'm gonna come back on now. Darn, I never get through enough. <laughs> I love it all. I wish that we could just go through for hours. <laughs> I know, and I and I apologize to everyone for my misspellings. I literally added to that PowerPoint yeah, last night. And so I've got, and I do it so quick because things are just new. They're happening all the time. So yeah, there's yeah. a lot to keep up with, but yeah. the whole, everything that you talked about is so empowering for educators and parents and the kids. I love that instead of just treating kids as if they can't get this stuff, that you're presuming their competence and, oh, absolutely. you know, like helping them to understand their bodies. Because I think especially a lot of times with people on the spectrum or, you know, different labels that people will kind of forget that they have those same needs for knowledge about themselves that everyone else does. Oh my gosh, yes. And so this is just so lovely. And um, we do have, uh, we just have two questions. Um, so I guess I will ask those first and then um, I may have a follow-up or two if that's okay. 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 <laughs> okay so the first one um, is, is self-talking connected with brain development? That is a great question. And um, so I don't want to speak definitively because I don't have the research for that. But what we do know is that um, when you can give yourself a narrative, I talk to myself out loud. And I did that intuitively as a little girl. And I do it today. So I think anything, what you can name, you can tame. And that is from Interpersonal Neurobiology of Dr. Dan Siegel. So I think anytime you can journal it, say it out loud. Um, I think saying it out loud is can be very calming to the nervous system. So yeah. anytime you can express it, I think that's very helpful. Um, so for people who have difficulty with speech, um, who may communicate differently, how do we help them learn this self-talk? I mean, they may be having inner thoughts, you know, that they can't express yet. Um, but is there any way that we can help support them better? So, of course, through technology. I mean, you know, there are so many great assistive technology, but I want to take it more than that. I want, I want to say we all speak really the loudest through our bodies. We all speak the loudest through face. Yeah. You know, and so giving our kids the opportunity, not 93% of our communication is nonverbal. 
So having our kids read, you know, non-verbally and to understand, and even just to share through body movement and through art is, is actually more accurate than verbal, you know, than using yeah. words. So using images, using art, using pictures, using, like, I just want to get up. And, is music? Uh, is music. Use, I just, I was just going to say that I just want to get up. We used to scarf dance, you know, we used to take these scarves and we, and, you know, and we would just dance around the classroom and wave them and move them. But dance is huge. You know, any type of artistic expression is communication. Yeah. I've noticed. So my own daughter is non-speaking and she uses augmentative communication and she's extremely communicative with her body language. But one of the things she does is uses technology for self-talk. So she doesn't quite have the, the words yet through her communication device, but she will use YouTube videos. So for instance, Daniel Tiger, when he's uh, playing, you know, some thunderous music in the background, she will play that when she doesn't feel well. See, and they, and she intuitively does that. So you need to write that up as a practice, Jen. I think that would be that would be helpful for I mean, what she has learned how to do intuitively and then how you've interpreted that and how you're communicating in that way. Yeah. Through the music, through mood, and through her ability to pick a YouTube. Um, so really, yeah. you know, because I just, I want, I want to like reassure people that even if their child does have difficulty with, you know, traditional communication, that there are a lot of ways available for, you know, to help support them in, in feeling their feelings and being able to express them. Um, so everything, all of your ideas are really helpful. Um, okay, so the next question was, how should we create safety and security for an adult child with ADHD? Well, I mean, it's really, it doesn't matter because, so think about you know, co connection and safety are human being needs. And so we create safety when we're intentional about an environment um, that feels calming to that individual. So if it's an adult with ADHD, then we need to ask them, what would you like, you know, pick off the smorgasbord, you know, pick off the buffet, what would feel calming to you? What do you need in the environments that would feel, calm? you know, what people, what experiences, what places, what things feel calming to you? And then again, we ask adult children, we ask adolescents who in the building, if you are feeling um, rough or dysregulated, who are two adults that you want to go to where you feel safe? And we, we put it, we put that on our students. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Um, okay. So I guess maybe just like one more, um, thing to dive into a little bit more. Um, you did mention this topic quite a bit, which is really important in terms of not focusing on the behavior or not even referring to it that way, but talking about, you know, the brain body state and, um, you know, the slide that you showed about the ear muscles is so important. Um, you know, my daughter will cover her ears at times, even if I just, even if she doesn't noticeably look stressed to me at first glance, mm -hmm. if I start speaking, she will cover her ears. And so that's my cue to like give her the space and stop talking at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, but as far as, you know, behavior. I mean, kids are even described as having challenging behavior. So mm -hmm. how do we like make that shift so that we start seeing it through that different lens? Um, you know, I know what you're asking. The way we, it, you know, it, it, it's like been such a habit to kind of view behavior in this like willful way, I guess. And so how can people to process? And so I'm just going to give one suggestion. And, and I write about this in the new book. When you change your language, you change your perception. And when you change your perception, then you can really change the, 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 the neurobiology of, of 
like looking at brain and body state rather than behavior. So let me give one example. We are always talking about consequences. What if we started to ask and replace the word consequences with experiences? Instead of saying, what consequences does my child need to not run out of the room every time there's a transition? Then we say, what experiences does my child need so that they won't run out of the room with every transition? Yeah. And that's, that's, I believe that's where you start yeah. because it begins with us. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, I would love to ask you more questions, but I know we should probably wrap up. Um, I am so grateful for all of your knowledge. And um, if you want to share any resources, we will definitely put them along with the YouTube link. Okay. Um, and, you know, with our Facebook, um, on our Facebook page. Um, so um, I think that was the only housekeeping we had, but thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, and thank you. And Jen, also the resources I mentioned can be found on my website too. Okay, perfect. So we'll make sure that we link to that as well. Yeah, the website is there and um, also Ed Utopia um, for if, you, if they Google Lori Desitel, Ed Utopia, and then my YouTube channel too. Okay. It's yeah. perfect. Yeah. Yeah. All thank right. you. Thank you so much. I hope you and your family um, do well in this, uh, the rest of COVID. And, uh, you know, thank you for all of the great tips so that we can all try to feel a little more calm and regulated. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Jen, so much. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. Or if you are listening later, thank you so much. And please feel free to reach out to me at any time. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.